afternoon and welcome to Moments with Melinda. My name is Melinda Moulton and my guest today is Hugo Martinez Cazon, who has just written a story in the Vermont history for the Vermont Historical Society on the Lumaire brothers who uh, discovered color photography and had a building in Burlington. So let me, hello, Hugo, how are you? Hi, Melinda, it's great to see you again. It's so great to see you. I'm gonna read to my folks a little bit about you. Sure. Okay, Hugo Martinez Cazon has worked for more than 30 years for private in environmental consulting companies and for the Vermont State Department of Environmental Conservation. Since 1992, he has dedicated his spare time to uncovering the story of the Lumiere Company in North America, hoping to encourage the preservation of their remarkable factory building that still stands on the Burlington waterfront. And here it is, here's the story right here. It's great, it's amazing. Since 1992, that's a lot of time. But listen, Hugo, let's yep. start by you sharing with my viewers, who are you? And, and tell us a little bit about your life and what brought you to this. Oh, sure, sure. Um, well, I'm originally uh, born uh, in Argentina and partially raised both in Argentina and the United States. And I've lived in Vermont over 30 years. Um, and I've really always been very much interested in environmental engineering. And um, so I've lived in Vermont, like I said, 30 years, worked with private sector consultants for a long time and then uh, worked for the state. And, uh, and both of those have really gotten me into a position to get to know um, a big part of the history of Vermont just by um, being where people have worked and traveling to almost every town in, in Vermont. So um it's a great experience and it's a great way to 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 understand uh vermont and to understand a part of vermont which i think is uh maybe not as well known which is the um the non-rural part of vermont's history and um so that's that's been really fascinating for me i, I you were asking me about me earlier i mean when I was 14, I used to go to the library in Argentina and read the census, um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I think that everybody, they have a, some characteristic of theirs uh, as they're growing up. I think that told me something about what I would like to do in the future. Um, I, I wanted to understand uh, how the population in, in my home city of Buenos Aires had changed over the years. Um, and so I kind of brought that kind of, of way of looking at it, uh, brought me towards finding this building. Um, and also in Argentina, as uh, in lots of places, the Lumiere brothers are, are hailed um, a lot. Um, the United States, I think people that are into photography and cinema might know who the Lumieres are, but they're not as much of a household name. Well, I certainly didn't know who they were. I mean, I and, and by the way, you and I have worked together and to my viewers, uh, Ugo has been really instrumental in protecting the environment here in Vermont through his work. So I wanna bring that up too, cause I've had the opportunity to work with you. Uh, and you and I met a couple few years ago uh, when you shared the story. So let's, let's jump right into this. Sure. You've been working on this now since the 1990s. So what 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 happened? I mean, how did you get involved in wanting to research and know about this? Were you walking down this down the down Flint Avenue and happened to see the building and go, oh, what's the history with this? What what was that inspiration? What was that spark? Um, well, to to do the work that I do um, uh, in the ninth, late 1980s. Um, I started looking at historical maps as a way of understanding the industry that I was trying to, you know, when I worked for private sector and try to figure out what was the process that was underway in the factory to understand what kind of impact it might have and, and what action might be needed. So uh, in the 1990s, technology was not what it is today. And so to look at old maps, um, I was looking at an old map on microfilm and you had to turn 
the handle around and, and spin the, the microfilm. And so I was trying to do work on a particular project and in spinning the, the microfilm around, um, you, you would see the image go by and this image of a building upside down, the, the, la the, the name of the building was sideways. Uh, I saw that it said Lumiere and I stopped because uh, in, I knew who the Lumieres were. I was recently in Vermont and I thought, well, it could be a, a French last name in Vermont because there's a lot of French names in, in Vermont. And, but I just kind of kept scratching my head and going back to it and saying, well, the, the, it says that it makes photographic materials and that would be quite a coincidence. But the part of the story that's hard to convey is that for most people that know who the Lumieres were, the, the story about them is that they were geniuses, but kind of recluse, and their factory was right next to their house, and they didn't go out building factories all over the world. So there would be no reason for this building on this map to be there. And also, you asked me, how did I find the, the building? Uh, the map just showed the outline of the building. It didn't really give me a good idea of where it was located. So it took a while to even figure out where this shape was originally and had no idea if the building still existed because it's a building from 1901. It could have easily have been torn down. So it took a long time to figure out that this particularly shaped building was where it was located. Okay, so. So, let's, so, so let's talk about, it's on Flynn Avenue, and, yeah. we're, and, 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 you, and you talk about it you know, in your article. I, uh -huh. I, I think it would help to get folks to understand who the Lumiere brothers are and why they chose Burlington. If I could have you read from the book, a sure. few paragraphs, um, and I think we should read uh, from page 124, which really mm -hmm. talks about why they chose Burlington, because they came from France, Mm -hmm. Right. And they had their factory and their business there and they, they had an office in New York, but they came to Burlington, Vermont, yeah. uh, which is really what inspired you to do this story, because they uh -huh. were really the, the, the fathers, the creators of colored photography. And yeah. so yeah. this is this is extraordinary. So why don't we read this chapter to get all of our our viewers up to snuff about what this is about? Sure. Thank you. Uh, it's called The Choice of Burlington, Vermont as the Location for Lumiere, North American. By 1900, the small city of Burlington on Lake Champlain had become a powerhouse of dye production for the textile industry. It would soon find itself coloring the images of the world. Burlington offered an unparalleled combination of advantages for the Lumieres. The placement of the Lumiere factory in Burlington was both a commercial and a scientific strategy. Although distant from the population centers in Boston or New York City, the town's port facilities and robust railroad network allowed product delivery to the East Coast and easy access to the Midwest, as well as an export route to Canada. Burlington was an industrial center with unique chemical and manufacturing expertise. Alongside some of the nation's largest medicine fabricators, such as Taft's Merline Toothpaste and the Wells and Richardson Patent Medicine Company, Burlington was home to the Diamond Dye Company, one of the largest producers of chemical dyes in the world. The chemical advancements necessary to achieve improved black and white images were even more important for direct color photography. Another great advantage was that Burlington's substantial French speaking workforce would allow a vice president from Lyon to run the factory. At the dawn of the 20th century, Burlington had a population of 18,640. The city was served by three railroads, Central Vermont, Rutland, and Rutland Canadian, and was one of the largest lumber markets in the world wholesale manufacturing trade amounted to $14 million annually, and that would be about $391 billion in today's dollars. Uh, and smaller industries employed some 3,500 people with 
with monthly wages, receipts of $140,000. Soon, Lumiere North American was listed among the city's cluster of industries. Thank you, Ugo. Thank you so much sure. for reading that. So um, let's dig into a little bit of this history. Um, sure. And then we're going to talk about the cover as soon as we understand uh -huh. what a little bit more about this. Uh, who were the Lumiere family? And, 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 and in this and what you just read, we know now why they chose, but who were they? Tell us about them mm -hmm. and, their, and, and who they were. Well, first we have to start with Antoine. Antoine Lumiere uh, was kind of the patriarch of multiple generations uh, of inventors. So that's pretty unique to them. Uh, Antoine um, perfected black and white photography and uh, there was a lot of competition in the 1890s, 18, yeah, 1890s to the 1900s to really have a high quality black and white image. And so he propelled that and his son, Louis, uh, began and then continued to work with his brother, Auguste. And Louis and Auguste uh, worked under Antoine uh, and built the Lumiere photographic industry into the largest in the world. Um, just in the 1900s, there was a big World's Fair in Paris. We could talk a, a little bit more about it later, but they represented one of the largest uh, producers of photographic materials then. In 1895, they had um, invented uh, cinematograph, uh, film, movies. And so by 1909, every town in the world would have a movie theater. So this is the, the degree to which the Lumieres changed our lives. And um, Auguste and Louis began to um, explore how to make color photography, something that people had been working on for over 100 years and had said, this is just not going to work. We have all the best chemists in Germany, Poland, Russia, England, France. Everybody was working on it, not only in the United States. It's just not going to happen. And so uh, Auguste and Louis were also inventors like their, their father. They worked on cinema and color photography. And uh, there's another generation of, of Lumieres after them but the decision to make the building here for uh, photographic plates um, was during Auguste and Louis Lumiere. So they, they were really pivotal in making the decision to come here. Um, and today the Institute Lumiere is really very renowned and we can get into that a little bit more, uh, but the, the Lumiere brothers are a Nindo introduction um, in, in Europe. So uh, this building is very, very important because of that. Well, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, <laughs> thank you for that, Ugo. Um, now, now, they were only in Burlington for a few years from 1901 uh, up until about 1912. And the factory was built specific to their needs, which meant that it had to be very, very dark. Um, so it was specific to their to their operation, but then they closed it down. Why, why why did they close it down, and what happened to the building after they left? Well, the 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 reason they came is also in a way the reason they left. The reason they came to Vermont, uh, and you know, Ver Burlington was a thriving small town. Um, that had all the conditions that they were looking for. But the reason they came to the United States was the United States was a very large market for their products. And the tariffs for importing photographic materials were so high that they could never dream of making the product in France and exporting it to um, the United States. And also photographic materials were kind of like with the, the invention of computers or the invention of the cell phone. It was impossible for the policymakers to come up with a good policy on taxing the imports because it was a new technology. So that's what brought them here. Now, 
10 years or 11 years later, there was a swing in the policy on taxation for imports. And so it became too expensive for them to produce the film in the United States. There was a lot of demand for it, but the price was going to go up if they continued to build it in Vermont. So it was really a commercial, it was not at all that the product was not successful, quite the contrary, it but it was just too expensive to make it at that point. And it was a business decision and they sold yep. it and I, they sold it at a loss from what I understand. So yep. one of the big, one of the, one of the uh, focuses of mm -hmm. no pun intended of your <laughs> article is, is autochrome. Now we all remember Kodachrome and the other chromes <laughs> that we get film that we would put in our cameras and then we'd send off in a little bag and our pictures would come back. Well, they, they, they created an, an, an autochrome, uh, which was a process at the time that did not exist. And, and, and it was said, and in quotes, that the pictures themselves are so startlingly true that they surpass anyone's keenest expectations. Now on the cover of the Vermont History Journal, which by the way, folks, it is volume 89, number two, the summer, fall, 2021, there is a photograph. And my understanding is that this was one of the first photographs that was taken with ectochrome, with autochrome. Autochrome. Do you want to yeah, well, talk it's... about that? Yeah, yeah, that's, um, that it, it, you know, if you're holding that magazine, it reproduces the first time a magazine had a photograph of a person in color. So it's it's the first, first magazine cover showing a person in color, 1908. That is so a nice just, point. It's amazing. Yeah, and what, what happened was that the, the printing industry you know, they had no reason to believe anybody was going to invent color photography. So they didn't have the technology to take a photograph and reproduce it onto a magazine cover. So autochrome came out in 1907, and you mentioned Kodachrome, just to put everybody in the same picture. Um, Kodachrome, you know, like if you ask everyday people, they say, well, Kodachrome, late 1940s, maybe early 1950s, I remember my parents or my grandparents, or I had a camera from those days. But um, this is 1904, and it's 35 years before, and the color quality and the detail is amazing. Um, there's, there's a photographer called O'Gorman, uh, o apostrophe G O R M A N. I hope that your listeners will will look that up uh, as an autochrome because there's this beautiful suite of photographs taken by that photographer, and it's just beyond description. It, it you can see pebbles on uh, on a beach, you know, uh, individually. It, it's much better quality than the early Kodachrome. And Eastman um, actually when he heard that the Lumieres were beginning to build a factory here, did everything he could to try to steal the, the process because the competition was quite amazing. This was going to be a new oh, product that nobody had imagined possible. Yeah. Uh, so it, it took Kodak many years after to, to come up with anything similar. So how long did the auto, autochrome remain popular? And then what, what did replace it? Uh, well, autochrome, uh, it was, it's really great. In, in 2019, I went to Lyon and I, I visited the uh, Institut Lumière. Uh, they have a, a, a big festival every year for film. And uh, there's a little store there I went to. Um, this young man focuses on antiques. And one of the things that people come from all around the world to buy are film that he has been finding over the years. And so um, he showed me some, uh, he opened a box of Lumiere film just so that I could see what the box looked like when you, when you packaged it. And um, so, yeah, I mean, the Lumiere film was made into the 1930s. But then the Lumiere company was uh, coalesced with the Jugla, uh, that's J-O-U-G-L-A, 
company that made film as well. So they combined forces and uh, it became Jouve La Lumière. Um, but uh, the decision to leave uh, Burlington was made by the Jouve La Lumière company because by then Jouve La had bought into the company. So, um, you know, in, in reading the article, refrigeration was really important to the operations of the Lumiere factory. Mm -hmm. um, and they ran pipes a thousand feet into Lake Champlain back in 1901. Now, as an environmental consultant, would you have approved this back then? Or then you probably would have approved it, but- Well, I would have because there were no regulations. Right, but, so. <laughs> today, but today they couldn't have been, they wouldn't have been able to do that, right? Uh, well, I'm not the person that, that that regulates that, so I wouldn't be able to give you an answer. Um, I think that um, I think it would be designed, you know, within the rules that are prevalent today. Uh, back in those days, they were able to to just put the pipe in the, in the water. So you're right. I mean, they 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 were able to just do that. Um, and today, it would be different. But the water, the water refrigerated the building, so the, it was really amazing that they could they could keep the building cool at a, at a steady temperature throughout the year, and um, they also they also anticipated what would become a clean room, so like um, you know like IBM or or a Intel factory making chips. Um, they anticipated that they needed to have an environment where there would be no dust that could land on the film. So they, they were really controlling um, the manufacturing rooms in a way that's very, very modern by today's standards. Um, and um, the, the cooling tower is still visible. If you go to the building, uh, it's above it's a, it, you can see it above the boiler house. So, 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 how I would get to the building is to go down Flynn Avenue. Do I cross the railroad tracks and go left? Uh, that... No, as soon as, as soon as you cross the railroad tracks, uh, there is an immediate right into a, a driveway that goes side, uh, yeah, sweeps around and goes down, and you'll see a, a really, really tall, um, beautiful brick uh, chimneys that will lead you to the building. It's and, it's a flat, very, very large building, uh, one story building, and then the boiler house is separate. And there's a small administrative building that still stands and uh, each one of them has businesses in them. And it's still there. The I mean, build, it's, it's, all in, it's all still there. Still yeah, occupied. it's amazing. Well, here's a picture of it, I'm gonna put this up. Uh -huh. uh, and, and, and Ugo, who who bought who's there now who's who's occupying the building um uh, well there's a, a number of businesses are there um the the business that you'll see when you approach the the main entrance of the building is burlington beer company oh. and they've been in the news because they recently um uh, went there and they're really they've been very supportive and they really really are appreciative that they're um part of the lumiere building so that's really cool so it's 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 alive and well and it's brewing beer and isn't that fabulous? It, um, it is. It, it is. is. And 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 it it, it uh, also it's wonderful to see that people um find a, a sense of identity with with the building and that this is a, a heritage that uh, that's going to be into the future. So it's not I see it as today being the beginning of the story. Um, it's not just, oh, well, we know the Lumiere building is there and that's the end of that. Uh, this is going to have many chapters into the future and I'm are you doing really excited about that. Are you, are you the one who's doing the chapters? Are you working on the chapters? Well, I think that there's, uh, there's some things that I certainly am doing. Um, it's, uh, but also um, uh, people that have been really supportive, like uh, Mike, uh, you know, I want to, before I get, too far ahead of myself. I want to thank Mike Sherman, who who was the editor at Vermont History, who, who picked up the the story and helped um, get it to publishing. My friend Louise, who helped me with edits, and um, and also, I mean, 
there was a small article in the free press about it. Well, actually not a small article, a really well-written article in the free press about it. Um, and um, the other thing that you'll see in this article it, that really, really seals the story as being legitimately the Lumiere factory is that there's an inventory of everything in the factory from 1904 that uh, is in the, in the book of deeds. And um, I had figured out that there had to be a visit by the Lumieres to the city. So one of the things that's in this story is that the Lumiere brothers did come to Burlington. And yeah. the inventory kind of proves uh, the, the functioning of the building and what was in the building. Uh, Mary O'Neill at the city of Burlington helped me find that, that document. So um, I think that the chapters into the future will be about understanding who the workers were. Um, it was a French speaking community and that that's a really important part of understanding our past here. So, um, so what do you think the Lumiere brothers would think of our smartphones taking photos and storing them and sharing them and allowing us to correct the photos and enhance the colors right from a small little thin box in our hands without any wires or chemicals? How do you think they, what do you think they think about that? You know, I think they would not be too surprised. I, I think that they were very, very advanced thinking people. Um, and it's amazing how much was possible even with those technologies. They, um, when they came out with color photography, one of the things that the press talked about is, this is such high quality imaging that we can't tell it from the reality. And people are gonna be, they were discussing this, exactly what you say, they were discussing already that journalists were going to be able to edit the photographs and, and that you wouldn't know what was real anymore because the color photograph was of high, such high quality. Uh, but also they invented so many other products that um, I, I think they would have been tickled, but I don't think that they would have been shocked, you know, because I think they were really creative people. Well, tickled is good, Ugo. It's, it's good. <laughs> so I am. Just, I also was blown away um, about the amount of research that you've put into this, and it's been, you know, twenty some years that you've devoted to this project, um, and it was such an enlightening article. What do you think about having it made into a film? I mean, oh I, well, it it this story would make an incredible film. I I am. So happy you asked that question. I didn't know you were gonna ask that, but but yeah, I would love, 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 love to find uh, the resources to make this a film. Um, my friend, uh, filmmaker John Suma, helped me make a trailer, and um, you know, it it would be a wonderful um, fiction movie, a period movie, like and it, it yeah. certainly would be a wonderful documentary. Um, and I think both of those would work really, really well. And it fits in with film. I mean, it's all about film. I mean, why wouldn't there be a film about this, this extraordinary story? So, um, I'd like, I'd love to know what your next project is, or is this, are you just going to continue on with the Lumiere brothers and this incredible story is what, what are you thinking? Well, right now, um, uh, I'm getting support from, um, the French consulate representative in Vermont which is really exciting. They've been very, very warm and thoughtful about this uh, because I think that, um, you know, it's the heritage of, of French culture in Vermont that needs to be um, preserved and celebrated, but also the best way to do that is to have an active, active role into the future. So, uh, I think there will be more things to to celebrate that and to make it more uh, accessible to people. Uh, I'm researching right now uh, an article that I hope to have out, a, a shorter article, not as long as this, but now that the building is kind of recognized for what it is, um, I think the story about the workers is where, where I'm focusing right now. But certainly there's there's more research to be done on the autochrome process itself, the chemistry of the process. Um, 
Uh, what we haven't talked about is uh, the, the amazing influence in art that it represented then and, and how it changed art. Because um, one of the things in this article is the, the role Alfred Stiglitz had in um, giving us uh, access to autochrome. Mm -hmm. he, he took photographs in autochrome. He was the most representational artist of his time uh, in photography. Um, he was married to Georgia O'Keeffe. And uh, but to, to know that he took photographs in autochrome and, and, and the thing that I really love about his role in this is that Stiglitz, in his own words, says that the autochrome process made at Lumiere North America and the shorthand in those days was the LNA process, Lumiere North America. He says, I have film for autochrome that's from Lyon and from Burlington. Wow. And he says, I really love the quality of the film. From that's Burl the LNA process, the Lumiere North America process. So to have that from Stiglitz directly is pretty special. It was, it was uh, like you said, it took many years to investigate, but that was such a joy to find. Well, Ugo, you know, we've run out of time here. I, I want my viewers to be able to find this article. Mm -hmm. And I know that it's in the Vermont history of the Vermont Historical Society Journal. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, it's, it's online. It's, it may be online, but you have to log in to their site. Mm -hmm. Is there an easier way for folks to be able to read this article? Well, uh, my understanding is yes. I mean, for one, um, you can definitely read it at the library, the public library. Uh, typically, they have a copy of the Vermont History Journal. And my understanding is that after a few months, uh, you know, because this is primarily uh, the publication goes to the members of the Historical Society, uh, eventually it will be online and accessible uh, publicly. Well, as, so as soon as it is, I would love to know that. Well, I'm going to have to sign off here. We're at the end of our show. Hugo Martinez goes on. I am just, I am just enamored with this story, with this article uh, about the Lumiere North America company that, that ended up on Flynn Avenue in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, and I've just, I've always just enjoyed you and your company so much. And I want to thank you for taking this time today with me and my viewers. And I'm going to stop the recording. I'm asking you to hang on here a little bit because I want to just wish you well. So to my viewers, thank you for tuning in. And I will see you again for Moments with Melinda. Goodbye. <laughs>